Once upon a time, it is related, there was a man who had to give a present to someone he did not like, but wanted to impress. He found himself in the china department of the great and expensive London departmental store called Harrods, and was looking around when there was a sudden crash. Someone had knocked down a costly eastern vase, and it was soon being swept up in fragments under the eye of the department's manager. Our hero suddenly had an idea. He asked the manager, What's going to happen to that? Is it going to be mended, I suppose? No, the labour cost will be too great. We are throwing it away. I'll give you five pounds for it. As soon as he was the owner of the shattered vase, the man asked Harrods to pack it and send it by post to the man he had to give the present to. The idea, as you will have guessed, was that the recipient would think that it had been broken in the mail, but had been worth a thousand dollars. The vase arrived all right, but when it was unpacked, it did not escape anyone's notice that every single piece had been carefully wrapped in tissue paper by the store's packing department. Sufi teachings, including exercises and literature, have often been taken apart in the West, broken down and rewrapped, and then delivered to the grateful consumer. The only difference from our story is that most of the students who have done the smashing didn't know that they did it. Most of the people who did the wrapping thought that it was the right method. I am constantly coming across examples of this process, which has been going on for a very long time. In my own case, no sooner have I published a book, sometimes only given a lecture, than I find the materials broken down and reassembled and given out as part of existing knowledge, in the case of scholars, or as materials of esoteric importance, in the case of the cultists. And this is not experienced by me alone. If it is objected that the parallel is not exact, since the recipient could not fail to observe that he wasn't getting a whole vase, let me just say that it is only a matter of time before this part of the story is fulfilled. We can look at the approach to Sufi perceptions in the light of three stages of learning. This, again, closely follows the right and wrong ways in scientific education and research, though not the pattern of the occult esoteric attitudes with which Sufism has sometimes been confused. 1. Enjoyment. When people learn little, whatever they may imagine they are doing, since emotion fills them and becomes, as it were, something which they are consuming. People in this phase are merely amusing themselves, though they may be good citizens, depending on how they behave. This is rooted in greed. 2. Employment. When people try to use materials prematurely before they have been sufficiently prepared to attain any real knowledge. This is rooted in impatience and selfishness. How much to try to use is the point here. 3. Deployment. When the person is attuned to the extent and way in which he can serve and be served, so that the teaching is really able to take effect, to become active in and through the individual. In any of these conditions among the Sufis, the instructor's task is to 1. have the necessary experience to know the destination, the objective, 2. have the qualities to assess the individual's case, 3 have the capacity to monitor and help to conduct the learner's progress. Using this framework, it is possible to see how easily people can go astray in an improperly articulated search for truth. If they enjoy and care to call it holy joy, or enjoy sacrifice and call it sanctified suffering, they occupy themselves with an intake which is a nutrient only for the appetite, emotional stimulus, which should first have been attenuated. This is not, of course, any argument in favour of being miserable. It means that there must be a balance in the emotional diet and an understanding of one's own subjective, evasive proclivities. When people try to steal something, to use it too soon, it is because they have a tendency to want to do so before they have taken it in. This means that they do not, in fact, have what they think they have, because their desire for acquisition and transmission is stronger than their desire to learn. 
Since we are living in the abode of decay, this kind of procedure holds good for many other human activities, and you will find it in non-spiritual areas, generally to their detriment. It can be useful to use such areas when one can find them for observation and self-instruction. With this kind of tool, and with a careful study of the materials contained in various books and lectures, it is increasingly possible under present-day conditions for people to observe, if not to enunciate, the interior parallelism of scientific, psychological and religious formulations within the observable part of the Sufi phenomenon. The present restlessness, uncertainty as to the future, and even the increase of coercive systems which, often unwittingly, encourage greater and greater sociological and psychological knowledge, make it, in our experience, more and more possible to establish and maintain the kind of community, in the wider sense, in which Sufic study can develop. Where people no longer have certainties linked to coarser material things, they will seek personal and group stabilization by adding some subtler range. Traditionally, under these circumstances, they have tended to reach out for this range beyond. Though we must pay some local prices, some tolls, we have very little to complain about so far as real Sufi prospects in the modern world are concerned. As with any fresh interest without deep traditional and culture-based roots in a given civilization, there is bound to be an overabundance of unsuitable people attracted. Let them be attracted. The study sorts them out. This is true both in the attraction and in the sorting out, in the branches of science now looking at the Sufi heritage and activity. Subhani says, Yes, the world is illusion, but connected in it, certainty is manifested in it. The Sufis aim at an understanding which can readily be stated as finding other ways of perceiving the world and a knowledge of things beyond normal ken, which also requires, for it to become effective in our ordinary human sphere, to be assessed and evaluated by intellectual capacities which are not ordinarily found in mechanical thought. Many striking illustrations of this are to be found in the vast repertoire of instruction tales which we call teaching stories, and several hundred of which I have published in over a dozen books now in currency both in educational and general use. Another way of referring to the Sufic development is to say that experiences and perceptions beyond the familiar range are to be gained through what are known as mystical methodologies, but that these can be understood and employed in the mundane situation only when there is a developed means to do so which has been correctly organized in the human mind. So Sufism requires both experience and organization, both perception and interpretation. This distinction, you will observe, is not widely adopted in other systems. A Sufi should be able not only to know, but to do, not only to think, but to have something exceptional to think about. This Sufic understanding must, because of the foregoing necessities, be developed without any exclusive or out-of-kilter usage of the cultic or the academic approaches, but must employ the advantages of what underlies both. Just remember, if you will, as soon as you see or hear the word Sufi, what associations it conjures up, and match these with what was said by Al-Hujwiri in the very oldest Persian treatise on Sufism, the Revelation of the Veiled, on the whole subject. Sufism was formerly a reality without a name, today it is a name without a reality. And it was possible to aver this centuries before many of the great Sufi classics and textbooks were written by such great authorities as Ibn al-Arabi of Spain, al-Ghazali of Persia, Rumi of what is now Afghanistan. If the object of Sufism is to become a Sufi, to reach a certain kind of understanding of things, which I might call extra-dimensional cognition, and if the goal has been reached and the way to retrace this path is known to living people, 
and if some at least of these living people are engaged, though not necessarily exclusively, in enabling others to tread this path, certain differences between Sufi thought and action on the one hand, and other more familiar systems on the other, immediately become apparent. Perhaps the most noteworthy of these differences is that the development and applications of Sufism as a study will be organised and projected by the Sufi exponent a. in the light of his own experience, rather than by means of repetitious doctrine, b. in accordance with the actual potential of his students and not by speaking into a void, as it were, and c. adapted to prevailing circumstances without cleaving to tradition for its own sake. If the conventional type of teaching organisation has a stock of information and tested methods and students of a certain capacity, it will seek to bring these factors together in ways familiar to all of us in the more usual sort of school, university and so on. But for the Sufi, the world is not at all static. The knowledge to be imparted is seldom formal or factual. The student is neither a picture to be filled nor something to be processed, or even regarded as only someone who can learn a skill or is to practice the profession of Sufi. The Sufi's position, rather, is that he is someone who has experienced something, who sees how to impart it almost from moment to moment. He structures his method almost instinctively so as to help to achieve the desired end. This formulation constitutes the only development and application in which he is interested, indeed, in which he is competent. To convey this sense of Sufi thought and action is in itself one of the major concerns of the Sufi exponent. In diluted but approximate terms, if the formal, the conventional thinker says, as has often been stated, Instruction is information, training and the development of abilities in the student. The Sufi says, We help to impart Sufi capacity, whether or not this involves instruction, information, training and development. Our role is not to impress or mystify, or to insist on certain acts or beliefs, or even on the reaching of easily quantifiable goals, or yet even to make sure that certain ideals are maintained. What we say and what we do is always subordinate to, and commanded by, our perception of what the learner needs at any given time or place, and under the prevailing circumstances, in order to arrive at similar perceptions. Many people do not want Sufi experiences, whatever they may think or say. It is no part of our task to disturb their real situation. And so we have the famous saying in a celebrated poem by the 13th century teacher Rumi that the Sufi is made wise by the truth, for he is not a scholar from a book. The book for the Sufi is something which fills an instrumental, not an informational or mental exercise role. Failure to observe the secondary, what I have called lower level stabilization of the study and action of Sufism as water finding its own level is the direct, and to the Sufi as probably to the anthropologist, plainly observable, cause of the theologized, formalistic, mechanical and quasi-academic versions of so-called Sufism in both the East and West. This is most easily demonstrated in the work of Orientalist, religiously didactic and ecstasy-oriented individuals and groups whom the late 20th century upsurge of interest in our subject has stirred into a frenzy of propaganda and publication, not to mention the also secondary but understandable phenomenon of vituperation directed at those who try to redirect attention to the customary approach, which, after all, is abundantly documented in a large number of the extant Sufi classics, upon which both scholarly, derivative, research, and dervish exercises, mimetic behaviour, are allegedly, but in the event highly selectively, based. 